Hello and welcome to your daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson, back from vacation in the hills and hollers of rural Pennsylvania. It is good to hear you, sir. I am Jer Stays. It is Monday, August 17th, 2020. Let's get started by thanking our newest member on Patreon, Brittany. Welcome to the fold, and we will get your stickers on the way. That's right. And if you can swing it, remember to become a member at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. It's a great way to support this show, get some free stickers, and get your name read on the air. And by the way, Jer, speaking of which, uh, I got a really nice tweet from a listener last week while I was on vacation uh, asking me, uh, he had apparently noticed that I was not on the show and he he had asked, you know, are you not going to be on the show this week? Uh, so listener, you know who you are. I'm not sure if uh, your name is listed on Twitter is your real name. So, uh, but you know who you are and uh, it was, it was nice to be recognized. Well, you deserve it, sir. Let's get started. Michigan's coronavirus cases continued to climb over the weekend, and Monday, another 465 cases were added to the tally, along with one fatality. There now have been more than 93,000 cases and 6,300 deaths due to COVID-19. The transmission rate of the virus, or RT number, sits at 1.05, so that indicates viral spread. There are also some important bits of news to know around COVID-19 around the region, Macomb County saw the highest level of new coronavirus cases last week with a positive test rate, nearly double that of Oakland County. In our region, it's now the suburbs driving the rise in coronavirus cases as a number of people have not been taking the virus seriously, declining to wear masks, and not social distancing. Sterling Heights, Clinton Township, and Warren have the most overall cases. Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle was also the first county leader to lift the coronavirus emergency. Over in Oakland County, reports are that their county executive is worried the Make America Great Again cruise on Woodward over the weekend may spur an outbreak. Unofficially put on by a group resistant to wearing masks, the cruise featured classic cars and Trump 20 banners that read, ah, your feelings. It was such a well-attended event that Smart, the suburban bus system, instituted their dream cruise rerouting to serve passengers better. In Wayne County, Livonia parents organized a protest on Sunday against online-only schooling. A group called Reopen LPS, referring to the Livonia Public Schools, says that computers cannot replace face-to-face -face learning. This is on the heels of a similar protest in Gross Point. In the city of Detroit, the eviction moratorium ended Saturday with a wave of evictions expected to come over the next few weeks. The city government has a number of resources to help if you're in need, and you can find them at DetroitEvictionHelp.com, or you can call 866-313-2520. Of course, we will put a link and that number in the show notes. As to the economy in the city of Detroit, things are slowly improving. There's still a very high level of unemployment, however. According to the University of Michigan's Metro Area Communities Study, the jobless rate in the city is now 38%. That's down, actually, though, from a high of 48% unemployment when nearly half of Detroiters were out of work. For context, before the pandemic, the city had an official unemployment rate of just under 10%. Good times, Jared. Good times. And then, uh, Jared, did you see the news out of Portland? There was a MAGA boat cruise up the river, and uh, apparently... The participants ignored the no-wake rules and ended up swamping and sinking a boat. They had to, like, rescue the passengers. Well, I, I guess cruises are a theme here. Which I would call a metaphor, but it's a little too on the nose, a little too literal to be a metaphor. There's a bipartisan deal in Lansing to support K-12 through schools with additional dollars for dealing with the coronavirus. However, what this isn't is a budget funding schools for the school year. As we mentioned last week, weeks into the new fiscal year for public schools in Michigan, there has been no budget passed. The package of bills passed by the House and Senate today disperses $583 million in federal coronavirus relief funds dedicated to schools, or about $350 bucks per pupil. There's $50 million in hazard pay for educators and $18 million for local districts to assess how kids are doing with the new mix of online and in-person classes. One hot-button issue was attendance and whether online schooling will count as enrollment. The compromise was a 75-25 formula. 
So that means 75% of a district's per-pupil funding will be determined based on last year's total of students and 25% from online attendance this year. Michigan Senate Republicans agreed to remove a requirement that schools offer in-person learning to K-5 through students. This is as many districts this year are opening with 100% remote instruction. Schools, however, have to make sure there are two-way interactions between 75% of students and their teachers on a regular basis, and every 30 days, districts need to reconfirm their plans to use in-person instruction, virtual learning, or a combination of the two. The package of bills as of this recording was on its way to Governor Gretchen Whitmer's desk for her signature. It's key to note that this doesn't cover the main budgets for schools in Michigan. The state is staring at at least $3 billion of a budget gap, and federal help isn't coming anytime soon to support local governments. At this pace, it's pretty much inevitable that there will be cuts to services statewide. Some Ferndale residents are upset at what they're saying are surprisingly high water bills. WXYZ reports that due to new meters being installed, a number of Ferndale residents moved from estimated billing to more accurate billing. The old meters were not sending data reliably, you see. Because of that, there are reports that some people's bills are quadrupling on a month-to-month basis. The city of Ferndale says that they're offering payment plans to help people with this through the pandemic. Residents say there should have been more communication months ago when this program rolled out. Jerry, I would just add that uh, I live in Ferndale, of course, and I remember when they installed the new meters, and and, uh, personally, I got quite a bit of communication notifying us that they were doing that. Yum Village, an Afro-Caribbean restaurant in Detroit's new center, is taking a break for a week to make some improvements. Earlier this month, we mentioned that Chef Godwin Ihintugi got into an accident. After some time in the hospital, he's back on the mend and in the kitchen. What's going to be happening this week is they will be installing a new fryer, hooking up an oven, adding a patio barrier, and, crucial in these coronavirus times, adding a walk-up window. That make it at least the second walk-up window in the neighborhood that I know of to go with Milwaukee Cafe. Walk-up windows are a hot thing as they allow for quick service, social distancing, and help stop the spread of COVID-19 because people do not have to go inside. Jerry, you love you some walk-up window. Yum Village is on Woodward at Stevie Wonder Avenue, also known as East Milwaukee Street. They're going to continue their service to charity organizations during this time. I will link to their Facebook post in the show notes. Sven, uh, we need to patronize this. No no doubt about that. Uh, So glad to hear that Godwin is uh, getting back on his feet and everything. And um, yes, we are way overdue to go uh, have some of his excellent food. New protected bike lanes running through Rouge Park in Detroit look to be completed. That's according to the Detroit Greenways Coalition. The new two-way bikeway that shares the road is freshly paved in some sections and has bollards to protect bicyclists from traffic. number of Detroit streets built extremely wide for automobile traffic have seen bike lanes and other bicycling infrastructure built on them in recent years. Much of Detroit's infrastructure was designed, of course, to serve a city that is was more than double the current population. Officials are now looking at repurposing much of that infrastructure. The bike lanes look real nice. We will put a link to the photos in today's show notes. You know what, Sven? There are so many streets in this city that I think it's funny that sometimes the bike lanes go on somewhere where, like Cass. Which is a narrow street. Which is a narrow street when I've got John R. right near me. I live right near John R. And there are four lanes that nobody uses. But what they do use them for when they go by is at like 50 miles an hour right past my dining room window. Yeah. Uh, So it would be really nice to cut those in half because there's never the traffic. And, I mean, even before the pandemic, there was never the the traffic. And this is left over from when, you know, we didn't have freeways. Mm -hmm. And people would use John R. and 2nd and 3rd for commuting into downtown Detroit. And I feel like we could add a lot of amenities and then not bug the people that are over on Woodward or something like that with with bike infrastructure. We were saying the same thing the other night when we were hanging out at Barter on Joseph Campo in Hamtramck. You know, that was, I mean, what, that's like a six-lane wide road or something like that? Five lanes, I forget. It's insane. It's it's way too much. There is nowhere near the traffic demand uh, to keep that, and they should start converting that into bike lanes and patio spaces for some of those businesses. The Motown Museum is getting another boost from a billionaire born in Detroit, Steve Ballmer. The former Microsoft CEO and current owner of the Los Angeles Clippers has given $3 million through his Ballmer Group philanthropy to the Motown Museum, 
for its upcoming expansion campaign. The construction of the first of four planned construction phases resumed this spring after a short pause thanks to the coronavirus. Phase one, entitled Hitsville Next, will serve as the museum's educational and creative hub. It's designed to offer innovative education and community engagement programs. Announced four years ago, the Motown Museum will become a 50,000-square-foot destination that goes far beyond the couple of original houses that are there now. It'll have interactive exhibits, a performance theater, recording studios, expanded retail experience, and meeting spaces. It's good to see the Motown Museum finally get its due, Jared. There's so much history of this city here that we just don't celebrate enough, I think. There are three big sports stories we're going to talk about today. And joining me on the line is Fletcher Sharp. Good to talk to you, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. Let's start out with the fan favorite Detroit City FC. How was their weekend? Uh, Not great. <laughs> they faced their frenemy, Chattanooga FC, which normally would be a great match between two teams with very, very large fan bases. But inside of a very, very quiet Keyworth Arena, Detroit City FC lost to nothing. And honestly, at times, I wouldn't say they looked like they were getting beat on or outmatched, but there were moments of time where like they didn't really register a shot on goal until like late, where they started pressing for just a goal to try to get back into the game. Chattanooga is a very solid team. They have uh, one player of note, Ian McGrain, six foot four, who used all of his height and his head to help set up both goals. So yeah, Detroit's going to have to regroup because their next opponent is their in-state rival in Michigan Stars. And Michigan Stars tied against New York Cosmos 1-1 to with a late goal on a volley. So at the current moment, Michigan Stars is at the top of the NISA table and Detroit is at the bottom or near the bottom. So they need to tighten up. I know it's just early on in the season. It's just the second game in the NISA fall season. But feasting on semi-professional teams like they did with FC Buffalo and Cleveland SC. It's probably great just for, like to post pictures of like, we're winning, we're doing this, but it doesn't really prepare you for playing against other teams that also pay their players. So hopefully they can shake off the rust against Michigan Stars coming up for a really good game. Because if not, this is not a good start to a short season. And when is that next Michigan Stars Detroit City game? This weekend. And it's going to be at Ultimate Soccer Arena's outdoor field which is all the way in Pontiac. Well, Fletch, I understand also there's a change in regards to a big name tied to New Amsterdam FC. They're coming to town soon. Yeah, if you were trying to tune into that game or even just go to the outside of the field and watch, hoping to catch a glimpse of their new coach, Eric Winalda, former U.S. men's national team star, Eric Winalda, you don't have to do that because he resigned today, stating personal reasons. New Amsterdam FC was already not off to a good start. They lost to FC Baltimore Christos. They tied another semi-professional team, and they tied New York Cosmos in a game where they really kind of got beat up on for a little bit and just happened to get a goal. So they really were not off to a great start. So unless there's like a really, really horrific family issue we're not sure about, uh, it really just sounds like he did not want to continue on with the way the ship was going, which honestly, you can't really fault someone, especially during a pandemic. All right. Well, let's pivot to a sports story that impacts a lot of homes around the region. It's amateur, but important. The highest profile of high school sports football has been postponed to the spring due to coronavirus concerns. The Michigan High School Athletic Association made that call on Friday. Meanwhile, other fall sports like volleyball and soccer are continuing on because they're considered, quote, moderate risk, unquote. The MHSAA says that the low-risk sports include cross-country, golf, tennis, and swimming and diving. And, of course, those are continuing on. Uh, It's interesting, Fletch, that you've got many districts that are doing at-home schooling or online schooling, but showing up to the practice field. uh, Fletcher, what are your thoughts on this move? Honestly, I don't necessarily hate it, per se. I really don't think they should be playing high school football like at all. I know they're moving it just so like in case they get more under control, they can continue to play because football is the lifeblood of American sports. Without football or baseball, it'd be very hard for the landscape, whether it's high school, college or professional. So I know they really want to try to get games in, but it's really going to shift some really powerhouse teams because as I was reading an article and you can just naturally assume some kids when they're really, really good at a sport and there's a chance for them to graduate early instead of graduating at the end of 
May. They graduate like in December. Some schools who have kids that are really, really talented who are graduating at the end of the first half of the year in January, they will not be playing their senior year of football, which would be kind of odd to just have people leave before their season starts, albeit we understand why because it's COVID. But I'm not necessarily mad at them moving. I do find it kind of weird that you're still going to play uh, soccer and volleyball as well, considering that while the contact in those sports is not as prevalent, uh, you still touch people. Girls volleyball, I don't know if anyone's ever been there. You high five every single point. They get together, they scream, it's very loud inside of the gym, and they high five everybody after every single point. And I know it's going to be hard to tell people not to do that, but like they're going to do it. And soccer, like some of the biggest collisions I've ever seen in the sport have been because of soccer. So like if you're going to move football, you probably should be moving those as well. But, you know, I'm not in charge of that at all, so I probably don't really have a say. But the low-risk sports make a lot of sense. Those sports don't really involve contact. Cross-country, there's minimal contact if, like, go on the same turn together and happen to bump into each other. But aside from that, like, the goal is to stay away from everybody and, you know, get in front of people. Same with golf, same with bowling, et cetera. So, like, I'm okay to see that. And uh, finally, there is word that Michigan State is predicting a huge deficit and that some sports programs could be eliminated. Yeah. Apparently, they've lost about $85 million in revenue, which is significant. Yeah. Mainly because they will not be able to play football in the fall and might not be able to play basketball coming up, which most people might not know. Um, really, really big schools that have a lot of money typically have a powerhouse football program or a powerhouse basketball program, or they're really good at both. Maybe they're not great at both, but they're really good at both. Well, Michigan State is definitely known for being good. They're visible for both. Yeah. Most schools make most of their revenue in those sports. Like, it's very rare that a school makes their revenue in another sport. I think the one exception would be UConn, where they make a lot of their money in the men's basketball and women's basketball as well, because they have one of the best women's basketball programs in, like, the history of women's basketball. But, like, outside of them, mainly it's football and or uh, basketball. So not having that for the fall winter area is really going to hurt a lot of schools. So uh, hopefully they can shake something out. What could this mean in reality? Could we actually see sports that, you know, have scholarships and things like that go away? Yes, which stinks very much. So as a result of not having football, and I don't want to say football runs everything because I know some people don't really want to hear that, but football really does run everything. Hmm. Same with basketball to a degree. But say you miss $20 million from three weeks of playing football. About $20 million might go into funding your entire track and field program. Mm. So you might have to lose the men's track and field program, maybe the women's track and field program. You might not have a water polo team. You might not have a golf team because most schools are not very lucrative in those sports. They might put out some stars, might put out some great athletes, but unless those people are donating money back to those programs, the money you're getting is from your major revenue, which mainly comes from football. Honestly, not to like be that guy, these problems could all be very much solved if they just paid these players like the professionals are. Because if you pay the players, they can actually go out there themselves and have agency. But if you can't pay them, you can't put them out there as amateurs. Right, right. All right, Fletcher, good to hear from you. You can follow Fletcher Sharp over on Twitter at Saint FDW. All right, before we let you go, a little bit of international news. And look, I know it's something we normally don't do here, but you may have heard that a country near and dear to our hearts, Belarus, is in the news. Longtime listeners might remember that late last year, Sven, you went to Minsk, and that's the site of major protests against their leader, who is known as the last dictator in Europe. That's right. I was in Minsk back in November. I was a guest of the Press Club Belarus. We did a whole podcast episode uh, based on that visit. Um, that would be good if you're interested in these things. We, could, we will certainly link to it in the show notes. Listening to that and looking at the history and in a professional world before that, I dealt with the Baltic state sometimes. I'm surprised. I mean, this just seemed to happen. What What changed? Well, what happened was the country held a presidential election on August 9th, and the incumbent president, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, who's been in power for 26 years, uh, claimed to have gotten 80% of the vote. Uh, nobody believes this. The country has a long history under Lukashenko of holding rigged elections, and it set off mass protests in the streets. And you have to understand that uh, in Belarus, and we talk about this on the show, 
uh, on the episode, um, Belarus is, is a risky place to uh, protest. There's a long history of the Lukashenko regime cracking down on protesters and and jailing them, and and you know send. There are stories of people going away and never being seen again. The government has cracked down in this case especially hard on journalists and protesters alike. Uh, there have been some really grisly stories coming out about torture. Um, the opposition candidate, who was a stay-at-home mom, um, who had uh, really earned a, a lot, a, a surprising amount of support leading up to the election, actually fled the country with her daughter. She went to Lithuania uh, t- for her own safety. Wow. So what's the latest there? There are reports that police and some military officials even have resigned. Uh, today, news anchors on the state-owned television news channel refused to go on air. So they were actually just showing like footage of an empty anchor desk with some, you know, kind of strange disco music playing in the background. Uh, President Lukashenko himself went to a factory in Minsk and he was greeted with boos and calls to uh, go away and step down. Take a take a listen to a little bit of that right here. Meanwhile, there are growing fears that Russia could step in to to help put down the protesters, uh, which is similar to what they did several years ago in Ukraine. You remember when uh, the news about Russia annexing uh, Crimea, which was a a province in Ukraine. Um, Meanwhile, I've been trying to contact my friends back over there in Minsk that I met um, to make sure that everyone's okay. Um, I haven't heard from all of them, but I've been able to, you know, thanks to social media and everything, I've been able to mostly, you know, uh, verify that everybody's still okay for now. So, you know, definitely hoping for the best for all of them and and all the people of Belarus. You know, I got to quickly ask, did you think that this could have been coming when you went there or were, were you surprised by it? Well, there was an election, you know, I mean, as I talked about in the, in the episode that we did, there was a, a parliamentary election when I was there, um, stakes much lower for that one. And I, and I was, you know, was thinking about this the other day that, that a lot of the people I spoke with, and these, these were mostly journalists, they almost had like a flip attitude about the, the, the environment and the country, you know, they just kind of like, they, it was almost like they turned to humor to kind of laugh things off because I don't know, I guess maybe at a certain point, how else do you deal with it, you know, but, uh, things have definitely changed and, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I haven't been there, so I can't say exactly what has changed, but, uh, clearly the mood has shifted and I think, uh, it's going to be important to keep our eyes on because this is an important story. And that'll do it for today. I know since you've been on vacation, you wanted to thank someone, Sven. Yeah, before I left, uh, we got a new Patreon member, Carlo Silvio. He's a good friend of mine, uh, a a Detroit expat living in San Francisco. You know, years ago, Jer, I I visited him out there and uh, he hosted me for the day. And it was great because... You know, we hear all these stories about San Francisco being overrun with like tech millionaires and billionaires and everything, but he showed me that uh, there's still a, a thriving weird scene in San Francisco, and and that was great. But uh, Carlos is a great guy, and um, you know we appreciate his support. Yeah, I thank him for his support too. With that, I'm Jer Stays, and I'm Sven Gustafson. Take care of each other, and we'll see you all around Detroit. Yum Village is on Woodward at Stevie Wonder Avenue, also known as East Will Mo- y- <laughs> Will Will Mocky? Mill Mocky. Mau Mau Mau. Will Mocky. Will Mocky.